Good morning. Welcome to worship at Orchard Community Church. We're so glad that you could join us both online and in person. Um, When we worship God, we are reaching out for God. And there's a promise in Scripture in James 4, 8 that says, If we draw near to God, God will draw near to us. So we can know that as we reach out for God this morning, He will be here in our midst. Um, If I haven't had an opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at Orchard, and we're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Pray with me, friends, as we open our service. Let's pray. Loving God, we pray that you'd guide our thoughts and our words as we worship you this day. Let our hearts be filled with praise. Let us never forget the good things you have done. You forgive our sins. You've given us new life. You sent us your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. Renew our strength. Refresh our souls. May our worship glorify you in every way this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let's stand and sing together. Ready? kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty it's coming on the clouds and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's Open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the war? For the 
sins of the world His blood breaks the chains if Christ is truly enough for you. Please be seated. Friends, as always, you can find a digital bulletin for this service on the YouVersion Bible app. There's a link to that in the uh, notes section of your stream. There's also links to that in our uh, weekly email and web page. I'd encourage you to go to that bulletin and to see all the great information that's there. In any of those places, you can find um, updates on all the things that are going on here at Orchard. There's QR codes on your song sheet that can take you to those things as well. I just would commend that to you. Um, we're beginning a new series of messages today on stewardship, and you may have received this brochure in the mail. It's our stewardship brochure, and um, one of the unique features about Orchard is that we have a faith budget. We base our, our giving on um, what we believe the congregation will give, not on pledges. But you may say, how can that be when there's a pledge card in here? 
Um, that pledge card is really for you. We ask, we send this out uh, to encourage us to be thoughtful and prayerful about what we're going to give. And you're going to, you can fill out this little card on here um, just for you as a way uh, for you to have time with the Lord to think about what you might want to give. Now, there's a tradition here at Orchard um, that on the Sunday following the, the, the mailing of these, people bring them back to church. We'll put a basket up here and you can offer that in that basket symbolically um, as a sacrifice to the Lord, but we're not going to open it. We're not going to read it. You don't need to put your name on it. It's just a symbolic act, just us trying to encourage your thoughtful, prayerful consideration of what the Lord would have you give to him in this season. So just be aware of that. Um, want to also remind you, coming up on November 28th is the annual lighting of Orchard's giant Christmas tree, which is obscured by the tent, which is right there. Yeah. So November 28th is the first Sunday of Advent. It marks the official beginning of the Christmas season. We'll have the tent, the, the tent lighting. We light the tent too. The tree lighting ceremony. There will be food and music and activities from 5 to 7. The tree lighting ceremony is at 6.30. We'd love for you to join us. There's going to be signups to help out with that event coming uh, soon. So be looking for that. Um, Today, uh, ladies, is the last day that we'll be taking signups for the women's retreat in person here uh, on Sundays. Uh, following this, if you want to turn your registration in um, until the end of the year, you can do that in the church office. Again, in January, they'll have a table out there, so there's plenty of time still to do that, but it'll just go to the church office after today. Um, we're going to be taking communion this morning, so if you didn't have a chance to stop by the welcome table and to pick up your communion elements, um, head on over there at some point during the service today. Those of you at home, I'd want to encourage you just to gather those elements for yourself so that when the time comes, we're all ready to take communion together. Um, for, for giving this morning at Orchard, as always, there's a, there's a box in the back for in-person giving. You can also use our online giving app, which you can find links to in that digital bulletin and various places on our website. You can also mail that in, and we just are so thankful for those of you who are able to give. Last thing I want to mention is today is a special day. Today we are uh, having our chosen event with World Vision, and it's an opportunity to sponsor a child in Honduras, only it's a little bit different than uh, than it's been done in the past. It used to be, be that you might be given a picture of a child or pick out a picture of a child and you would choose them and say, I'm going to sponsor this child. They're doing it really differently now. There's going to be an opportunity today and I think next week for you to sign up and to have your picture taken or your family's picture taken and they're going to send all the pictures from Orchard down to Honduras to a specific village and they're going to put them up in a room and the children in that village are going to be able to come in and look at your picture and pick you out and choose you you um, as their sponsor. Children who often don't have a lot of control over their life get to make this choice. And then you'll be able to sponsor them and interact with them through the mail. And maybe someday, I don't know, maybe someday we'll go down and visit. I'd love that. But it's a really fantastic opportunity. I'm going to mention it in my message. Um, but I, there is a video over there about this event that will absolutely melt your heart. And so if you're thinking about this, if you're not sure, go watch that video and I bet you'll be sold. Old, all right? All right. Thanks, friends. I'm going to turn things over to Melinda now, who's always has, um, got a message for our kids this morning. Hello. Today, actually, the kids have a message for us. Since it's November, it's officially Thanksgiving season, and we asked the kids on Wednesday, we asked some of them to share with us, um, as they think about our church, what are they thankful for? So I just want to share a few of these with you. There are many more that we'll be putting up next Sunday for you to look at, but these are just a few. Um, the first one says, I am thankful for coming to preschool here and making friends, and I love that I learn about God. Thank you. The next one says, thank you, for, thank you to Orchard for letting kids come here. You guys are amazing. Thank you for summer camp and sending me, and thank you for Sunday school. Thank you for starting all of these camps. I think they mean VBS and dance camp that we can come to. They are amazing. And by the way, you have a beautiful church. I'm so grateful for the people that help us here at Orchard. Thank you for cheer and dance camp and for kids club, for church, and for VBS. I love it. I'm thankful for teaching us Spanish here. 
um, and for Trunk or Treat. I, I know so much friends. <laughs> Thank you. I am thankful for our church because we can learn about God here. Thank you for all of the arts and crafts that we do and for teaching us about God. I'm thankful for our teachers. This one gets me. I don't know if I can read it. I'm thankful, to, thankful for Luann for teaching me how to pray. Uh. <laughs> so... Let's follow the lead of our children. Ah. Luann, are you here? Did you hear that? Okay. Isn't that amazing? Makes your Wednesday afternoons worth it, right? Yes. Anyway, let's follow the lead of our children and think about our church and, and how God is using that, this wonderful group of people in our lives and what we're thankful for. And if you want to write a note, I'm going to pin yours up with the children's next Sunday. Thank you. And um, Melinda didn't uh, read the one that says, uh, Melinda is cool. <laughs> and, and she definitely is. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we are thankful. Thankful that you chose us to be your people, that you chose us to save us from our own selfishness and greed and sin. And so we thank you for that. We, thank, we are thankful for your generosity to us and for our ability to be generous to others and to give back to you, Lord, what you have given to us. Because as a wise man said in song, all I have and all that I am belong to you, Lord, completely. So we give it back to you, Lord, completely. We pray for people in other parts of the world who are in desperate circumstances from weather events, from, from difficulty with repressive situations from disease. And Lord, we pray that they have the opportunity to be thankful for you in, in the knowledge that you are a God who loves them and who sees their circumstances and still loves them. And we pray that they can find peace in you and we're thankful for the opportunity to reach out to alleviate some of the suffering in, in many tangible ways, one of them being participating in the CHOSEN program to help a child in Honduras, which has gone through and is still going through so many uh, desperate circumstances. We pray that that we will be able to help them in so many ways. And we're thankful for people in our congregation who have come through difficult circumstances of illness and surgery and for their recuperation. And we pray for their complete restoration in you. And so we continue to lift up others who are suffering because of their loss of job or loss of family, and that they would find peace and strength in knowing that you love them, Lord. And we thank you for the greatest gift of your generosity, your son, Jesus, whom you sent to live and die and rise again for our sake, so that we can be called your children, and so that we can live with you eternally. In his name we pray, amen. Please stand as we continue worship. How many of you guys remember, uh, and I guess they're still around as Rite Aid, thrifty drugstores going to get the five cent ice cream. My dad used to love to take us there when we were kids and we, we went there a lot. And uh, what my dad would do is I, I think he felt guilty if he was getting a five cent ice cream, like he should walk through the store and pretend like he's buying something, but. Uh, <laughs> 
my dad was really tall, so I was I was looking at the toys one time and I saw his head. <laughs> and I thought, there's my dad, there's my dad, I'm safe. <laughs> and I came around the corner, it wasn't him. <laughs> and I was scared, I was terrified. And uh, I started crying and my dad came running up, are you okay, what's wrong? I, was like, I thought you left me, I thought you left me. My dad said, I would never leave you. God will never leave us. This song is, whom shall I fear? We have nothing to fear. God will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Amen. You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night. Your presence, Lord. 
nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your all-living home. Your presence, Lord. I listen and sing of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence, Lord. had a great message last week from Andrea Messenger, and she talked about really how crazy the last year and a half have been and trying to find God's peace in the middle of all that craziness. And she highlighted, punctuated just how crazy it was by reminding us of um, all that toilet paper hoarding that went on for a while. How crazy does it have to be when that's going on? Well, it reminded me of something. Do you remember the great toilet paper panic of 1973? I don't because I was five at the time. But some of you who uh, are more seasoned members might remember the great toilet paper panic of 1973. True story, 1973 was a year of shortages. The stock market crashed. It lost 45% of its value, and there came shortages of things like oil, gas, and electricity. The country plunged into a recession and developed a kind of shortage mentality, and then the great toilet paper panic hit. It started this way, all right? It started with some unsubstantiated rumors. There was a couple of news stories about a tissue paper shortage in Japan, and no one paid much attention to it except one senator, Harold Frolick, issued a press release that, that said this. He said, the U.S. may face a serious toilet paper shortage in a very few months. A toilet paper shortage is no laughing matter. It's a problem that will potentially touch every American, or not touch them, you know? what I mean? Um, so the media uh, kind of ran wild with it as a funny story for a few weeks. But then one night on The Tonight Show, way before Jimmy Fallon, back when, uh, when Johnny Carson was leading that, Johnny Carson made a joke about this news story about to toilet paper shortages. And the next day, millions of people flooded every store in America and bought up every roll of toilet paper. They uh, immediately sold out the supplies. They started hoarding it. And a, I kid you not, a a black market toilet paper uh, developed, a, 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 a 
in the country. Well, eventually, after several weeks, people began to realize that there never actually was a shortage, that it was an artificial shortage created by gossip and rumor and cultural frenzy. And it seems like such an odd thing, right? That would never happen very often, an anomaly, but that's not true. Actually, artificial shortages happen fairly frequently in America. In 2017, you might remember Texas had a gasoline crisis right? Totally artificial. In fact, the governor, people were hoarding, there was rumors, people started hoarding gas. You could see these uh, guys pull up in trucks with like 200 gallon things and buy gas. And the governor finally had to issue a statement saying, look, the only reason there's a shortage is you're all hoarding. That's it. And that was the only reason and the, the artificial shortage Uh, ceased after that. But one of the reasons that these artificial shortages actually happen is because they play on a really deep-seated fear, a really deep-seated human fear in us, and it's the fear that we won't have enough, that we won't have enough of whatever it is that we need, that we won't have enough food, or we won't have enough money, or heaven forbid, we won't have enough toilet paper. That's a real fear in us, and we're going to address that fear today. Well, today is the first Sunday of November, as Melinda mentioned, and with November comes the beginning of the holiday season, and it begins with Thanksgiving. And, and Thanksgiving really means being thankful for the things that we've been given, and that's something that we surely want to do. But as people of faith, these two words, thanks and giving, we know that they are related on an even deeper level, and it it starts with God. We're going to be talking about stewardship, biblical stewardship, the theme of, of our new series we're beginning today called Thanks and Giving. Well, biblical stewardship, um, is recognizing that everything that we have and everything really that we are is a gift from God that really belongs to him and it's been gifted to us, loaned to us in a sense. And when we, when we realize that, when we really begin to look at ourselves and our lives with those kinds of eyes of faith where we see that, it, it, it changes our perspective on everything. And, and it should bring forth from us a response, a response of both thankfulness, of thanks, and of giving. And so we're going to be talking about these things. We're going to begin today with a key truth, really a foundational truth that absolutely cuts against the grain of that fear that I mentioned, that deep-seated human fear that we won't have enough. And this key truth, this key, this foundational spiritual truth that we're going to look at today is the fact that we have a God who abundantly provides for us. And that truth is really where biblical stewardship begins. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So friends, pray with me. Loving God, we pray that you would speak with power deep to our hearts, Lord, because artificial shortages happen in this world because of a real thing that's going on in us, because of a real fear that we live with, Lord, um, that we don't want to live with, that we know we shouldn't live with because you are a God who provides. So speak with power to us about your provision, your abundant provision for our lives today through this scripture. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's take a look at our main passage for today. This is um, Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. It's a story you may have heard before. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And so Luke, the author of our passage, writes this. It's in uh, your scripture or uh, on your song sheets. He says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then they Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to him about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all of this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to the disciples, 
have them sit down in groups of about 50. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. So says the word of God for us, the people of God. Well, as we look at this passage this morning, it's important for us to recognize that this is the only miracle that Jesus did, the only miracle besides the resurrection, that is reported in all four of the Gospels. Jesus did a lot of miraculous things, but there was something about this particular miracle that stood out so much so that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all report on this amazing story. Now, there's something else to know. This passage, this story, echoes several key Old Testament stories that kind of support and enhance its meaning. And I think knowing both of these things, that it's reported in all four of the Gospels and these Old Testament stories just resonate with it, I think these things really emphasize just how important um, this passage is and what it has to teach us is, is, is that important. So let's begin. Verse 10, the scene opens and the disciples are returning. Jesus had just sent them out to minister on their own without him for the very first time. And they were coming back and they were wanting to tell Jesus all of the things that they had done. So it says that they withdraw to a place near the town of Bethsaida. In verse 12, it calls it a remote place. So they were probably looking for a quiet spot to get away from the crowds that were now constantly following following Jesus because he'd become very popular. And, And they were looking for a quiet spot where Jesus could really listen, really hear what the disciples had to say. But I imagine also they were hoping for some rest, just a break in the midst of a a crazy schedule that they um, were were keeping up with the people always following them constantly day and night. But verse 11 says something. It says that somehow the crowd figured out what they were doing and followed them. And just like a young mom trying to use the bathroom in peace, her kids are not going to let that happen. I saw this video of these two kids standing at the door going, Mom, 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 Mom. And you hear this haggard mother's voice go, I just need five minutes to go to the restroom by myself. And they're like, where are you, Mom? We miss you. We miss you. <laughs> so just like a young mom, it isn't going to happen. They're not going to get this break. And honestly, if it had been me, I would have been annoyed. But Jesus isn't annoyed. In fact, it says in verse 11 that he welcomed them. And since they were there, Jesus takes the opportunity to teach and he even heals some of those who were sick that, at that time. So verse 12, we find that it's late in the day and the disciples, thinking strategically, they suggest to Jesus that he disperse the crowd so that they can go find something to eat because they are out in a remote place. The Gospel of Mark tells us they'd actually been there for three days and the implication is that people might have used up the supplies that they brought with them um, out following Jesus. And um, so Uh, They're going to need to go out and and find something to eat. This is a very large crowd, and they were going to have to disperse pretty widely in order to find something to eat because the villages in that time were very small. And this is the first place in the scripture, in this passage, that really echoes the Old Testament. The people had wandered out into the wilderness, and they had nothing to eat. And it's a replay of the Exodus the people followed Moses. He, he, he delivered them from slavery in Egypt and they go out into the wilderness and they find that they have nothing to eat. And what happens in that place? Well, God provides for them. They receive manna from heaven, a kind of bread from heaven. And this story reminds us of the character of God, that God provides for those who put their faith in him. And the question is, do we believe that? Do we really believe that God provides for us in the face of our deep-seated fear that we won't have enough? Now, clearly, none of these people were from Orchard because we would never follow somebody out anywhere without the promise of a meal, right? Or at least 
coffee and some cookies or snacks. Uh, we would just never do that. And we also need to remember that they didn't have places like Costco back then, right? So they weren't going to be able to find you know, food that easily. And even if they did, can you imagine 5,000 people cramming into one Costco? I mean, remember those pandemic shortage lines? It was ugly, right? Yeah. So the disciples wanted to disperse the crowd out of concern so that they could go find something to eat. The Gospel of Matthew says that Jesus had compassion on the people. It says because they seemed to him like sheep without a shepherd. And one of the main duties of a shepherd is to feed the sheep. In fact, the word shepherd in Greek means to feed because it's so integral to what it is to be a shepherd. So Jesus had already provided for their spiritual hunger with his teaching Now he's going to address their physical hunger as well. But this is where the story takes a weird twist with something we don't expect. Verse 13, Jesus says to his disciples, you guys give them something to eat. And the question is, whoa, what's Jesus up to here? Now Jesus may have wanted to see what his disciples had learned, right? He had just sent them out on their own. And if you look back in the first part of the chapter here, you'll see that when he sent them out on their own, he told them essentially God's going to provide for you and that they were not to take any bread or extra provisions along the way as they went out on their first mission he'd sent them out. And so I think Jesus was kind of seeing if they'd really learned anything about how God provides. Now they clearly don't get it and they are wondering what in the world Jesus is talking about here and uh, how are they going to feed all these people? That just was an impossible question to them. And, you know, we never worry like that, do we? We always trust that God will provide for us in every way, without question, right? That's that's what we do, right? Well, at this point, the disciples do a quick assessment. First, they report that they found five loaves and two fishes. Then they suggest that they could go buy food, but the Gospel of John tells us that Philip did a little calculation and was like, no, we can't. Um, So they come to the conclusion, essentially, that it's not enough, that they don't have enough. And that terrible, deep-seated human fear rears its ugly head right there in the middle of this story. Because really, where do you find food for all these people out in a remote place? Well, you don't. Unless, of course, you're traveling with Jesus. And that really is the key here. You see, the real question that Jesus is asking them is not about bread. It's not about food. The real question he's asking them is, do you believe that God will provide for you? Do you believe, disciples, that I have things in hand? It's a good question for us. Do we believe that? All right, amen. Do we believe that God will provide for us? And if so, why do we worry and stress out so much if that is really indeed true? And actually, I should have set up a mirror so that I could look at myself when I say that because I'm right there with you in that. Now, verse 14. um, But it's only at this point that we see just how bewildered the disciples must have been. Um, See, we know this story, but this is unfolding for them. And and all of a sudden, Luke uh, tells us in Luke 14 that um, they've been commanded to feed a group of 5,000 men. Now, they only counted the men. There were women and children there. So there's just thousands and thousands of people there. And it must have seemed to them like an utterly impossible task. And how often, when life gets hard, do we do exactly what the disciples are doing here? Because what they're doing is they're forgetting all of the amazing things that Jesus has done for them in the past. They've seen miracles. They've literally seen Jesus do miracles. And yet right here, they start to forget all of that. And you know, we've seen Jesus do miracles in our lives. So why don't we look to him? Why so often don't we? And, and if you're new to faith and you're thinking, I don't, I don't know if I've seen that. I just want to invite you to lean in and to wait and to watch 
because the Lord does amazing things when we put our trust in him. And I, you will not be let down. So here again, this story echoes the Old Testament. In the book of 1 Kings, there's a story about how God multiplied the oil and flour of the widow at Z- uh, Zephyrath. And each day when she woke up to make bread, she tells the a prophet Elijah, he says, give me something to eat. And she says, I don't have anything to eat. We're going to make this cake and die because that's it for us. And he says, nope, you trust God and it's going to be okay. And every day she gets up to make bread and there's just enough to make some bread for her and for the prophet Elijah. God multiplies what they have. But then in the book of 2 Kings, there is an even a story that mirrors this passage almost exactly in some ways. Um, there's a famine and uh, the, the prophet Elisha is uh, in the land and a man comes to Elisha and brings 20 barley loaves and a few ears of grain. And because of the famine, Elisha says, go and set this before the crowd. And there was a crowd of a hundred people there that day. And the man protests. He says, how can I set this before a hundred men? But Elisha tells him to go and do it anyways. And he says that the Lord had said to him, they will eat and have left over. So the man does what Elisha says and the people eat and there's leftovers just as God promised. Again, it's another reminder, another story echoing, resounding from the Old Testament saying, we have a God who provides. Do you believe it? So clearly the disciples had no solution for their problem. They're just standing there kind of with their hands in their pocket going, I don't know what we should do. So Jesus steps in, verse 15, and he says to have the people sit down in groups of 50. And they must have been wondering what in the world is Jesus going to do. And then in verse 16, it says, taking the loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. Does that sound familiar? That's the language of communion. We're going to take communion this morning. It's a foreshadow of another really important way that Jesus will provide for us. And the verb here, gave, when it says that he broke and he gave, it's in the imperfect uh, tense in Greek, which indicates a continuous action over time in the past. And so you could uh, translate this passage as that Jesus blessed it and broke it and he just kept on giving. He kept on handing out what he was breaking and it tells us that the miracle in this moment takes place right in Jesus' hands. Where else would it happen, right? So Jesus took what they had. They faithfully just gave it to Jesus, and he took it, and he blessed it, and he multiplied it. Then with verse 17, it says that everyone ate and was satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. So the disciples kept serving until everyone was fed. And it's not like everybody got just a little bit. There was more than enough. And there again is that powerful message echoing from the Old Testament and now being proclaimed right here through Jesus in the New Testament that God provides. You see, Jesus had trained his disciples in faith. He had taught and tested them. He had drilled into them that life, a, perf- a life of faith was not about having a perfect life. It was not about um, having the answers to every question. It was not about having no problems or needs. In fact, true faith was recognizing these things and trusting in God. True faith is the opposite. True faith is recognizing that you you don't live a perfect life. It's recognizing that you don't have all the answers. It's recognizing that you do have needs, that you do have problems, and it's trusting in God to provide for you in every one of those situations. True faith means recognizing these things that we have a God who provides. But even there's even more here because this miracle tells us something about Jesus. It's telling us that Jesus is even greater than Moses, even greater than Elijah. Because you see, the prophet Elijah spoke about the Messiah. And he gave an image of a great feast in heaven one day that the people of God will have with the Messiah. We know that's Jesus. One day we'll be having a great feast in heaven with Jesus. And this meal here, it's, it's a sign, it's a foreshadow that Jesus is that Messiah. That's what it's saying 
It's speaking about his identity, that he's the son of God, that he's God's ultimate provision for us because in him we have what we need most of all. We have God's love and grace and salvation. But again, do we believe it? Now, I want to be really honest in the fact that God doesn't give us everything we want, but he does give us what we need, yet there are going to be times when God doesn't give us what we need in the way we want him to give us what we need. And that can throw us off too. When I was 19, I've talked about having a, a, a disease that, that threatened my life, that caused me to be very sick for a number of years. I ended up having surgery like five times. And what I prayed for, what I needed was healing, but what I, how I wanted that healing was miraculously. You know, no surgery, no hard times. And God gave me what I needed. He healed me, but he used doctors and nurses and medicine to do that. And I'm standing here today with five feet less intestines, but I'm standing here today. So God will give us what we need, not always in the way we want him to give us what we need, but he will give us what it is that we truly need. So I want us to think about how Jesus did what he did. He took what they had and he multiplied it. And there are two really important things to remember about that. See, Jesus took what they had and he blessed it. And when Jesus blesses something, it's powerful. But in order for Jesus to do that, in order for Jesus to bless what we have, we have to give it to him first. We have to dedicate it to him. And and, and really, This is at the heart of of biblical stewardship. It's about realizing that everything we have, everything we are, is a gift from God. That it's been given to us by him and dedicating it to his glory. And I believe that this is absolutely one of the keys to unlocking God's provision in our lives. When our hands are tightly gripping the things that we have um, as though they belong to us and they've come from us, then our our hands and our hearts are closed to what God may want to give to us. But when we loosen our grip on what we have and we realize that it's a gift from God, then our hands and our hearts can be open finally to receiving what God wants to give to us, to receive God's provision for us. And I think that's so important. Because I think so often when that fear comes, we just grip even more tightly onto what we have, forgetting God and making ourselves um, unable to receive his provision. There's one last thing I want us to remember today about God's provision. And it's this. Sometimes God provides for us through other people. If you think back, you can probably think of some people who've provided for you. Of course, our, most of us, our parents provided for us, but along the way of your life, God has absolutely provided for us through other people. But what I really want to focus on in this moment is that sometimes God uses us to provide for others. Today, we have the opportunity to be used by God to provide for children in Honduras th- through the chosen event in through World Vision. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of yourself or a picture of your family or or upload one that you have. And like I said, they're going to send it along with everybody here at Orchard that does this down to a particular village. I think it's called Florida in Honduras. And they're going to put them up next Sunday or, or maybe the Sunday after that in a room. And those children are going to be able to walk in and choose you to be their sponsor. And you can write to them and begin a relationship with them. God can... Uh, use you. So I don't know your situation. I don't know your finances. I can't say for sure that you should do this. I trust you to make that decision. But what I do know, what I do know is that this is an opportunity to make an incredible difference in the life of a child. It's an opportunity to literally be a part of God's provision for them. It's a chance to remember what we have really belongs to God and, to, and our call to use it for his glory whenever we can. But I know that there's that, behind this question, should I do this, again, that lingering fear, right? That same fear, will I have enough? 
If I give some of what I have to sponsor a child, will I have enough? And of course, we need to be wise and careful with what we have, but we're also called to be faithful. So with that thought, I want us to look at our second scripture. It's Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and, and verse, part of verse 11. And it says this, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. God will ab- bless you in abundantly so that in all times you will have what you need and abound in good work. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. You will be enriched on every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. You see, part of a life of true biblical stewardship is trusting not only that God will provide for you, for me, but it's trusting that God will provide for us so that if, even if we give away some of what we have, um, we'll still have enough. We'll still be able to do that. It says right there that that promise, that promise that God will provide not just to meet our needs, but also so that we can give. So you see, part of biblical stewardship is this flow God wants to establish in our lives where we dedicate what we have to him and then he blesses and multiplies it not only to provide for us, but so that we can be generous and provide for others. But living in that flow means putting our faith in God's abundant provision over that deep-seated fear that we won't have enough. Putting our faith in God's abundant provision over that deep-seated fear that we won't have enough. I was thinking about it, and it's kind of like the difference between two chip commercials that were out a few years ago. There was a Ruffles commercial and a Doritos commercial that were out several years ago at the same time. And um, one of them, there was these two um, Eskimos, and they are on the frozen tundra, and they show that there's nobody for miles. I mean, you can't see a single other person, just frozen. And there's these two guys huddled together, and one of them is eating a bag of Ruffles, and he's really happy about that. And the other guy is watching him eat a bag of Ruffles, and he's not so happy that he doesn't have anything. And finally, he says to the guy, can I have a chip? And he says, if I give you one, I'll have to give one to everyone. Of course, you know, there's nobody there, right? But it's a kind of a... a, 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 a an idea of scarcity. But at the same time, there was another chip commercial for Doritos um, nacho cheese, and Jay Leno was the pitch man. And after uh, you know, giving the pitch for great tasting crunchy chips, the, the catch line was, crunch all you want, we'll make more. And you know, when I think about the way that God works, at least in terms of these two commercials, God works much more like Doritos than like Ruffles. You see, our call is to put our faith in God's abundant provision over that deep-seated fear that we won't have enough and even to be willing to share some of what we have knowing that God will abundantly provide for us. Amen? Amen. Our passage this morning echoed communion and now we're going to fittingly take communion. But before we do, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes for us to quiet our hearts and our minds, to be at peace before the Lord. It's an opportunity to give over anything that might get in the way of that. It's an opportunity to forgive, to seek forgiveness as we come to this table. So let's just take that quiet moment.
Friends, this is the Lord's table. And Jesus, our Savior, invites everyone who puts their trust in him to come to this table and to share in this meal. And we don't come to this table because we've somehow got it all together spiritually or in any other way. We come to this table because we come looking for Jesus, because we know that he provides for us, because this cup and this bread, these are the visible signs of God's invisible grace poured out for us. They are God's provision for us. So friends, pray with me. Loving God, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive communion. We pray that you would forgive us our sins, that you would open our hearts to receive your grace this day. God, meet us in this moment. Meet us in this meal. May this be a spiritual moment with you. We pray, God, that you would renew our faith, that you would calm our fears, that you would remind us, Lord, that you are in control and that you will provide for us. Lord, we pray that you would um, be with us, not just in this moment, but as we travel through this week together, that we might live more deeply for you. Now hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So it was on that night that Jesus was arrested some 2,000 years ago as they sat at the Passover meal. Jesus took the bread of that meal and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken, this is my body given for you. So friends, now let us take the bread together, symbolic of our unity in Christ. This is Christ's body broken for you. And then in the same way, Jesus took the cup of that meal and he said to them, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. So friends, let's take this cup together again, symbolic of our unity in Christ, the blood of Christ shed for you. Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Amen.
to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the our service is always just going to be some folks over to the right here to pray with you about whatever might be on your heart and mind. I want to encourage you to check out the chosen table and to think about whether sponsoring a child is the right thing for you. But let us go from this place knowing a key foundational truth that the Lord God Almighty is a God of provision and abundance. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah. <laughs>